Hey everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pit. Glad to have you here. Today we're going to do another episode of the Memory Lane series, the place where we take a look back at some interesting articles and interviews from old guitar magazines. So my dad has been subscribed to Guitar World magazine for about 30 years now. He saved a bunch of old magazines. He was kind enough to let me borrow some. So the one we're going to look at this time is the November 1992 issue of Guitar World magazine. Here's the cover. I'm going to share an interview with you guys done by Mr. Alan DePerna. He sat down with the members of Sonic Youth and asked them some questions. Now, if you've ever listened to a Sonic Youth song before, you might have noticed the tone sounds, frankly, pretty bizarre, to be honest. Sonic Youth has an extremely unorthodox style, so we're going to find out more about that in this interview. i got to warn you, though, this interview is pretty lengthy. You can pause the video and take a nap if you want. It won't hurt my feelings. So let's get started. I'll let you know who answers each question. Here we go. The media has singled out Sonic Youth as monarchs of the underground. How do you feel about that? Ronaldo, flattered. What else can we say? More. Our biggest ambition, our wildest dream, was to get as big as the butthole surfers, or maybe Black Flag. To me, that was just the zenith, like you couldn't go any further. Who would want to? But I guess our success has something to do with the fact that we stayed together so long, and the fact that we're so absurd as a rock band. The way we approach songwriting and music is somewhat absurd compared to the MTV style of pop, and I think that's intriguing to serious journalists. I mean, entertainment tonight doesn't do anything on us. It's not like we're as big as the Chili Peppers or Ministry. I don't think we're as easy to deal with. Suddenly, it seems like the world is full of noisy guitar bands playing Fender Jaguars and weird tunings. Ronaldo, it sure does. Do you guys feel like more? Like we're responsible for them? Yeah, possibly. A lot of those kids who start those bands are into us, man. They're saying, hey, Sonic Youth are doing weird things with weird guitars and going beyond standard formula guitar playing. Our whole thing is that we never really took off from classic technique, which is what Hendrix did. He was extremely knowledgeable of traditional technique, and he went off and created his own language from it, and that to me is a sign of real progress in a guitar player. But we developed totally pure from that. We developed our own language in the abstract. We never woodshedded standard playing, you know. Blues 101, Flamenco 101. I would love to know how to play that stuff, but I don't. I only know how to play the way I play, and nobody else plays that way. I think we can hold you personally responsible for raising the price of Jaguars and Jazz Masters on the vintage market. More. Yeah, Jay Maskus of Dinosaur Jr. also. Massis is really an extremely technically proficient guitarist. He exploits the Jazz Master to the fullest extent, but I don't think it'll ever get as bad as Slash and the Les Paul. Before Guns N' Roses, you could only get Les Pauls for like 10 bucks. They've gone up and down in price a few times. More. Right. There was a time between Clapton and Slash where you could get them real cheap. Since the success of the Cool Thing single, in video from Goo, have people tended to perceive Kim as the focal point of Sonic Youth, the front person? Gordon. No, I don't think so. I mean, maybe more than I was before, but Thurston still sings most of the songs and is in the videos and all. But you know, people are suckers for girls who are scantily dressed. That's kind of what I meant. Gordon. It was weird when we did the video for our new single, 100%. Jeffen was all concerned that MTV wouldn't show the video because I was wearing a t-shirt that says Eat Me and has a Rolling Stones logo, a mouth with the tongue sticking out. But I guess if I was wearing pasties and a g-string, it would be just fine. I suppose they're anti-feminist. You've encountered that kind of attitude? Gordon, well yeah. Just the fact that they didn't want me to wear a t-shirt that was kind of feminist oriented, so they don't support it. Why is Eat Me Feminist? Because it's aggressively sexual instead of passively sexual? Gordon. Yeah, and I guess it's sort of the same thing as saying F you or something. But you wore the t-shirt, right? Gordon. I did, but I had to cover one of the letters with my bass strap. It worked out. The strap just naturally covered it. 
I'm just trying to figure out what letter got covered, and if the remaining letter spelled out anything interesting. Gordon. I guess the E got covered. Overall, Dirty comes off as being more noisy and aggressive than Goo, also more overtly political. Why? Ronaldo. Well, I have to laugh at the first part of that, because every person we talk to these days has an exactly it has an exactly opposite take on which of those two albums is the dirtier and noisier. Half the people seem to think what you said is true, and the other half think Goo was dirtier. We think Dirty was recorded a lot better, so a lot of our noisiness and abrasion was translated more accurately. I would probably tend to agree with you that the new record sounds dirtier, but people have had varying opinions on that. As for your other point, I don't think we consider ourselves a very political band. We usually write our songs from our personal experiences, but since the last record, a lot of stuff from the political arena has crossed into our personal arena. That's just so much incredible stuff going on all over the world. Gordon, it's hard to ignore what's going on. It's what's been on TV for the last year or so. The politics are just a prop. What do you mean? Gordon, they're just dressing on the content. So something like the Anita Hill case or the rioting in LA is just a symptom of something bigger? Gordon, exactly. When a self-produced band like Sonic Youth decides to bring in an outside producer, it usually signals some kind of turning point in their career. What does it signal? <coughs> Excuse me. What does it signal in your case? Gordon, for every record we try to do something different, whether it's just working in a new studio or whatever. <coughs> Hang on. Okay. We really wanted to work with the producer because we'd never done that before. We also felt that mixing by democracy is not the greatest way to mix. We got spoiled by this album. I don't think we'll ever go back to working on our own. It's just so much easier this way. Ronaldo. In the past, we ended up working with engineers who had never seen us play live, and that's kind of absurd for a band like us. We knew that wouldn't be a problem with Butch. He's seen us a bunch of times, and aesthetically, we have the same background. We did some unorthodox things, which set a lot of pace for the album. For example, we recorded at a slower tape speed, 15 IPS, inches per second, instead of 30 IPS. You get a lot more low-end definition at a slower speed. That's pretty well understood by this point. But most tech people, Butch included, feel that you get more hiss that way. For them, it's like you hold up the big wooden cross in front of hiss and low tech. But Butch went along with us on that, although it wouldn't have been his choice. Now for the $64,000 question. Did you discover any new tunings on this album? Ronaldo. We use fewer new tunings than we have in the past. I think we've consolidated our approach in that area. Our whole thing isn't about searching for new tunings anyway. We utilize them when they're appropriate. I mean, I find new tunings every time I sit down and play a guitar. Some of them stick around and some don't. So only one new tuning that I've been working on recently ended up on the album. What was that? Ronaldo. From the low string to the high string, it's G, G, B, D, G. Octave higher, and then A above that. So, it's basically a G chord with the 2nd or ninth, whatever you want to call it, on top. Ronaldo. Yeah, it's basically a modification of a tuning we've used in the past, which is G's on the bottom and top and D's in the middle. So, it's just a two-note chord. This new tuning is a chord with a couple of twists on it. Do you use fairly heavy gauge strings for the low G's? Ronaldo, yeah, like .52's or .56's. I'm really into heavy gauge strings. The lightest string I use is a .17. Once you get used to heavy gauge strings, they're a lot cooler, they're more resonant, and there's a lot more going on with the overdubs. Guitar World. On what song did you use that new tuning? I don't know why I said Guitar World there. <laughs> On what song did you use that new tuning? Ronaldo. I used it on Sugarcane on the album, and on Genetic on the 12-inch or CD5, whatever it's called, more. 
On a couple of songs like 100% and Youth Against Fascism, I discovered it doesn't matter what tuning I'm playing in. It's more based on the way I'm attacking the strings with the slide and where on the guitar I'm playing. The songs are very abstract with regard to the tuning I'm using, although in Youth Against Fascism, I do play some chords, but as far as new tunings go, I don't think I used any. Although Sugarcane uses a tuning that I rarely use, the Teenage Riot tuning, because it's not very conducive to expanding upon. What are the notes? More. G, A, B, D, E, G. It's one of the more difficult tunings with which to write songs. It's either very drony or it's just an unpleasant discord, which I don't really go for that much, but it works for Sugarcane. Sugarcane is about Marilyn Monroe. Tunic on Goo was about Karen Carpenter. What is Sonic Youth's fascination with female tabloid icons? I think Marilyn was a really interesting creative person. I'm fascinated by the fact that she was so extremely effervescent and beautiful and otherworldly, other and just the fact that her myth will not go away. In writing about certain specific personalities that are pervasive in our culture, I tend to succumb to the fascination. It's kind of corny. You try not to subscribe to such media garbage, but to me it's all pop art in a way. It's all American art, for that matter. It's our landscape. We're TV culture, goofy as it seems. The Brady Bunch is a part of real life for us. You were saying earlier how on certain songs, it isn't the notes you're playing that matter as much as the textures you're creating. More. Well, yeah, it's like Red Cross wrote a great song a few years ago called Notes and Chords Mean Nothing to Me, which was sort of a batty thing. But yeah, you do, you do need to get beyond the preciousness of music theory to get a better perspective on what you're doing. You have to find out about yourself more than you do about notes. Do you use slide a lot? More. I like to, but I don't use it that much. There are some intriguing sounds on the record like those high-pitched noises on Youth Against Fascism. More. That was basically a slide, I think. Just swooping, really, all the way up to the bridge. Some of those sounds you're hearing may be behind the bridge stuff, too. But it really chimes in at a very high frequency. If you capture that with the right microphone, it's really cool. I think there's some of that on Teresa's sound world. More. Right. Yeah. Ronaldo. The tuning I use on Teresa's sound world is a new in a certain sense. It's an old tuning, but I capoed it up. And that's the first time that I ever used a capo in a Sonic Youth song. So that sort of makes it a new tuning, I guess. Same old strings, but it's in a new key. What was the tuning for that song? Ronaldo. A, A, E, E, A, A. It's just like the G, D, G tuning I told you about. Only it's a step up. When I capoed it up to the third fret to make it a C tuning, it's got a little more of an upper register to it that way. That tuning has been around for a while. One hears a lot of dissonant half stop tunings in your music as well. Ronaldo, yeah, we use a lot of half step seconds, which we like. Thurston and I have a lot of tunings that make use of that. Kim, do you use alternate tunings on the bass? Gordon, only on one song, Drunken Butterfly. Hold that thought. Gonna jump. Now we're on page 92. Let's get back to the interview. What do you tune to there? Gordon, F sharp, F sharp, G, A. It relates to a guitar tuning. And then I play guitar on a couple of songs as well. On the Strip and Swimsuit Issue. On Cranber Way, you sing, I dreamed I kissed Neil Young. Is that based on a real life experience? Gordon, maybe. You're not telling? Gordon, no. Did you play guitar on Cran Brulee too? Gordon, yeah, it was just me. I just started playing something and Steve was playing along. Thurston was just doing some feedback on the guitar, making some weird sounds, and Lee turned on the tape machine. So we recorded it in our 8-track studio at our rehearsal space. On much of the album, the guitars are very sharply panned left and right. Is that Lee on one side and Thurston on the other? Ronaldo, exactly. Mostly it's me on the left and Thurston on the right, approximating our stage scheme. I was very poignant with Butch about wanting this record to be like that. 
In the past, mixers have tended to want to mesh the guitars and blend them across the middle of the stereo image. For me, it always seemed to be, it always seemed to take some of that power away. But recently, we heard a live DAT recorded off the radio on our last tour in Germany. They ended up panning the guitars really hard left and right, and it's one of my favorite live tapes. It's the first time you can hear what each guitar is doing and the way they interact with each other. The tape really stuck with me for some reason, and when we started with Butch, I mentioned quite a number of times that's how I wanted to pan the guitars. It worked out great. There are a lot of great wah-wah tones on the record. Who does most of that work? Ronaldo. I do most of it. Kim does some too. She generally uses it with the bass, which makes it really weird and dark sounding. When it sounds most like a typical wah-wah guitar, it's almost certainly me playing. Youth Against Fascism comes off as a reluctant kind of youth anthem. More, yeah, well, that chorus, this is the song I hate, is just me saying how I'm not really interested in singing protest songs of any sort. Because I'm not an anti-person. Especially in 1992, you'd think conditions would be better than they've been in the past. But they're better only on a false front. Things are really getting worse, so I feel compelled to sing about it, even though I'm not interested in protest songs. That's actually why the song is so much fun to play. It rocks out because we're not going to let things like that drag us down. It's a real fist raiser. More. I think it's the next single anyway. We're going to do an insane video for it, which they'll never show. How has mainstream recognition changed Sonic Youth's lifestyle? Ronaldo. It hasn't really. Maybe a few more people on the street know who we are, but that's about it. We've been doing this for so long that we're pretty much con content inside of it anyway. Gordon, Thurston and I recently moved into a bigger apartment. So, you're no longer in the cramped little place immortalized in Details magazine? Gordon, exactly. Well, that's the end of the interview. Evidently, Sonic Youth does some pretty creative things in the studio. So, that does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Until then, rock on.